In our previous excursions, we delved into the megalomania with the San Shayu, explored the sanctity within the Sanghili, the capability of the Hiragok, the ferocious poetry of the Legolo, and the system of the Yanmei. This is all to say that the races of the Covenant are not only varied in their actions and connections, but also varied in their different belief systems and their connections to mythology. As today, we'll be exploring the last three races to join the Covenant, the Kigyar, the Ungoy, and the Jirohane, exploring not only their apparent and hidden connections to mythology, but also the lore and beliefs behind these thralls of the Covenant. As a Saurian race, the Kigyar are one of the main infantry units seen within the Covenant, functioning primarily as snipers, scouts, and armored units meant to catch enemies off guard. This role for the Kigyar is especially apparent in Halos 2 and 3, as playing through the legendary difficulty will have you throwing your controller through the TV due to how easily these enemies take you out. <sighs> Referred to as jackals by humans, the Kigyar were one of the first species among the hegemony of the Covenant to encounter humanity. However, the Kigyar would have a complicated relationship with humanity, as many of their interactions, prior to the Human Covenant War, were thought to hold prosperous trade agreements, but instead became violent exchanges, as humans were continually seen as inferior to the Kigyar, with many being hunted killed, and even eaten in some cases. This is how the moniker Jackal began as the animal is a fierce and nimble wild dog that has been known, especially in ancient times, to be an opportunistic hunter. These dogs originated from the African continent, being seen typically eating away at dead animals that they had either hunted and killed or had come across as a free meal. More specifically, within Egypt's borders, a specific subspecies called the Golden Jackals or Egyptian Wolves were seen carrying off dead bodies to their dens, oftentimes seen around not only the corpses of smaller prey, but as well human remains, as bodies would be dug up and eaten by jackals, which resulted in Egyptian priests changing their burial procedures during Egypt's early days some 8,000 years ago. This, in turn, would craft an Egyptian god of the dead, of the underworld, and of funerary rites. Anubis. Referred to as Anpu by the Egyptians, Anubis was seen as the deity of the dead, a guide who aided those who had passed, no matter the means, into the underworld to be judged. We'll be exploring that in just a minute, but these roles as a guide and guardian of the dead were not his only role. Depending on the context of a person's passing, whether rich or poor, Anubis played some role in their processing. For instance, Anubis was, as well, the god of embalming, or the process of preserving the human body and sometimes animal bodies by preventing or stalling decomposition. This method was exhaustive and deserves a video of its own to discuss. The guys over at the Thought actually go over this entire process in really good detail, so if you want to check them out, I've placed a link in the description for you to watch. In essence, the processing of a body involved the removal of the brain and internal organs, then drying out the body of any and all moisture. Finally, the body would be wrapped tightly in linen and sealed within a sarcophagus. Throughout this process, the priests of the dead would invoke their god Anubis to aid in the embalming process, refraining from letting the body smell of rot as this would prevent or hinder the person from being able to use their body in the afterlife. This is why many of the priests during the mummification process often wore headdresses or masks of Anubis to not only represent his presence and guidance, but also his invocation. I should mention that the Egyptians throughout their mummifying of bodies between the 5th dynasty to around the 5th century CE believed that the heart was the soul of a person, as the heart would beat non-stop and was the organ connected to the rest of the necessary organs for survival. 
Many believed that it was the heart that housed who and what a person truly was, which actually leads to our next point with Anubis. In the time between the pre-dynastic period to around the 4th century CE, Anubis was passionately worshipped and was seen as the primary deity of the dead. However, after the death and rebirth of the god Osiris sometime during the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, Anubis would pass on his role as the primary god of the underworld to Osiris. Thankfully, Anubis would continue this tradition as a psychopomp as time went on. See, as a person died, they would be greeted by Anubis and brought into the underworld. There, Anubis would task them with announcing the 42 judges of Ma'at. If the person was able to do that, showing their devotion to their belief, Anubis would then take their heart and weigh it against the feather of Ma'at. During this time, the person would confess all of their wrongdoings, as well as confessing all of their good deeds, proclaiming that they were without sin. If their heart balanced with the feather, then that person would be allowed to enter into the field of reeds, or known as Seket Aru, living out their eternity in peace. This was as well written down by the God of Truth, Thoth, and given to Osiris for record keeping and acceptance into his divine domain. However, if this person's heart did not balance with the feather and instead weighed more, their heart would be devoured by the beast, Amit, erasing that person from existence. Throughout the Halo series, the jackals have a distinct connection to death, especially through many of the fights and unfair advantages in the series. You know which part I'm talking about. As they were not only the cause of many deaths for so many players, but as well with how many have been killed throughout the series. Looking at the different games from the main series to the Forerunner saga and even Halo Reach, we have seen unique variations on the jackals. All of these are Kig Yar, but all of these are varied given the region they originated from, the Rutian, deriving from the main continent of Rut on their home planet of Ian, the Ibishan, deriving from a small volcanic continent of Ibish, and finally the Tavoan, who hailed from a colonized asteroid of Tavau. So as these different subspecies of Kigyar fight to the death, and have easily become associated with death, so too did the jackals of Egypt result in the subspecies in creating an association with death. Speaking on the variations of the Kigyar, the Tavoan have only been seen in Halo Reach and a 2017 comic series, which has a lot of fans of the series asking what happened to the subspecies, and where were they during the events of the two main sagas. Currently, it's believed that a majority of the Tavoans were used in the attack on Reach, and being the primary infantry units as skirmishers, their numbers were decimated in the assault resulting in the subspecies being nearly wiped out. Along with the attack on High Charity during the events of Halos 2 and 3, it brought the Tavoan to a halt in their usefulness. Of course, this is all speculation, but let me know what you think down in the comments. Now, this actually brings up an interesting fact about the Kig Yar that connects their Saurian ancestry. What I mean by this is that the Kig Yar are both reptilian and avian, meaning that, specifically the females, are capable of a process known as parthenogenesis, a natural ability of asexual reproduction, where if a species, or even subspecies, is suffering from depleted numbers, they can produce more offspring to increase their population. Essentially, the females produce an embryo without the need for fertilization, making a near-identical copy of themselves. This might be why we see so many Kig Yar throughout the series, as they are able to produce a higher population in so little time, much like the Ungoy we'll be exploring later on. Something I find fascinating is that this process is found in both nature and even different religions around the world, with the term Parthenogenesis translating to virgin creation, with Parthenos meaning virgin and Genesis meaning creation. 
For the Egyptians, it was believed that vultures were entirely female and reproduced asexually. As well, the vultures were held in such reverence that pharaohs declared the Egyptian vultures as avatars of the gods. And if they were killed or harmed in any way, a person could be sentenced to death. Being that these birds were scavengers, they revolved around the dead and were believed to reshape a corpse from their mortal lives into the afterlife. Along with this was the belief by those living within Heliopolis especially that Ra, the Egyptian sun god, was the product of this process of parthenogenesis. Being a god of creation, it would only be fitting that his own birth would be in this unique way. The story goes that in the beginning, before there was even time, chaos and the watery darkness was all that existed. This was called Nun, and from Nun came a primordial hill called the Benben, a stone mound that was believed to be the very first pyramid and the precursor of the obelisks found throughout Egypt. From this mound came Ra, a sun rising that gave light to the universe. His first name came to be Atom, while in Nun, but as he gave light and life to the universe, he took on the name Ra, formulating his station as the sun god. As mentioned before, the act of parthenogenesis was common throughout other religions. One notable birth in myth was the birth of Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war within the Greek pantheon. In brief, Zeus was told of a prophecy that claimed that any child born from the Oceanid Metis would overpower him in nearly every way. Being that Zeus was currently in an affair with Metis, he quickly swallowed her, just as his father did to him and his siblings. However, later on, Zeus began to feel excruciating pain in his head, and requested Hermes and Hephaestus to relieve the pain. Quickly, they cracked open Zeus's head, and Athena erupted from him, fully grown, donning weapons of war and golden armor. Another mention of Parthenogenesis, and the most well-known act of it, is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Seen in the books of Matthew and Luke of the Christian Bible, it states the archangel Gabriel came down from heaven as a messenger of God. He met with the newly coupled Joseph and Mary in the city of Nazareth of Galilee. Here, Gabriel proclaimed that the Holy Ghost was conceived within Mary. After some time, Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem, but in their time there, the baby had to be born. As parthenogenesis is a fairly common occurrence among the many species here on Earth, it is rare to see it occur outside our corner of the Milky Way. But seeing the jackals take part in this act provides further connections to the mythology that helps create the Kigyar species. Whether it's the varying subspecies of the Kigyar, the Rutian, Ibishan, and the Tavoan, connecting back to the subspecies of jackals seen in ancient Egypt, and the linking to the god of death, Anubis. The Kigyar have a fascinating relation to the mythology that inspires them and the lore behind their species within the Covenant. However, the connections don't just end there, as another species to join the Covenant soon after them acts as not only their rivals in the Halo series, but as an interesting look into fanaticism. Good thing that food nipple's waiting for me at the starship, cause man, if I worked up a big, crunchy thirst! As the most common enemy throughout the Halo series, the Ungoy are surprisingly short, unintended, on mythical connections. However, that isn't to say that they are without links to myths, legends, and even history. Originally hailing from the planet Balaho, the Ungoy, known as Grunts by Humanity, are one of the primary infantry species within the Covenant, and the next species to join right after the Kigyar. Being described as an ape-like species, the Ungoy thrive in large numbers, working under a single leader. However, 
If their leader is killed in battle or decommissioned in any way, they will subsequently run in fear. In their workings within the Covenant, the Ungoi are primarily used as cannon fodder and laborers. Being treated as slaves, the Ungoi are seen as the lowest form of quote-unquote intelligent life within the Covenant. Hated by nearly every race among the hegemony, especially the Kigyar, the Ungoi were nearly fully sterilized and subsequently rebelled in 2462. Known as the Grunt Rebellion, this gave the Ungoi a standing among the races as they had devastated High Charity, thus creating the newfound standing that we see at the start of the series. For the Ungoi, they were given the designation Monachus Frigus, which means Cold Monk in Latin. When inspecting the thoughts behind the given name, the term monk could relate to the monks who tirelessly studied and worked in monasteries throughout Europe during the medieval period. Dating between the 6th and 15th centuries, monks were religious laborers within monasteries who spent nearly every waking hour transcribing the Christian Bible and similar religious texts, devoting themselves to a life without material possessions to gain a higher understanding of God's work and words. To show this, and what I believe is the true connection of the term monachus, is the specific hairstyle of the monks during that time. Known as a tonsure, the hairstyle was relegated to three specific styles to show a monk's utmost devotion to their faith and the work within the monasteries. Of the three, it's the coronal Roman or Petrine style that we'll be focusing on with this, as this hairstyle showcased a clean shaven head while leaving a ring of hair around the head, otherwise known as a crown or halo with halos being a symbol of divinity within multiple religions and even cult worship, leaving a crown of hair for all to see, shared with others that this monk followed their faith to a T. Desiring to be as close to divinity as was possible or allotted. Moreover, the coronal tonsure was meant to share the likeness of the crown of thorns that Christ had worn during his crucifixion. Of course, the tonsure described is not the only one or is exclusive to the medieval monks as the acts of cutting or shaving hair from one's head is seen throughout the world. For instance, in Buddhism, the rite of Pabaja has people become ordained as monks by shaving their heads and faces clean. As well, within Hasidic Judaism, men and boys are allowed to shave their heads but must leave their side locks, called payots, untouched as stated in Leviticus 19.27. For the Ungoi, the reasoning behind this connection is that when examining the look of this species, it's easy to see that all of them have bald heads like the monks would. The fact that monks outwardly showed their devotion to their faith is another link to this as the Ungoi worked in this fashion as well with some having an extreme fanaticism towards the Great Journey. Though many of the Ungoi only followed the Shan Shayum's belief in the Great Journey out of fear of annihilation, some showed a level of devotion through their violent bombings. For anyone who may be uncomfortable with this topic, I've put a timestamp up if you want to jump ahead. For those of you who have stayed, let's continue. These acts of unaliving oneself is not uncommon throughout history, and even in religious worship. As the act seen from the outside looking in, it paints the picture of someone taking their own life, either out of desperation or in their religious fervor. However, from that individual's perspective, it's seen as an act of self-sacrifice, a motive that can drive many to do the same in the name of something greater than themselves. For the Ungoi, they had specific squads that were meant to do bombings exclusively in this way to either demoralize their foes or take out as many as possible to halt their enemy's progress. In religious and cult worship, the act is a tricky subject, as many condemn it outright, while some accept it as a sign of their faithfulness and control. 
For many, in both antiquity and even today, humanity was seen as a gift given by the gods, and the specific act can be considered as an act of rebellion against the gods. In Greek myth and legend, the story of Antigone and the overarching story of Oedipus touches on this act itself. Written in play form by Sophocles, the story shares that Antigone, the daughter of Oedipus, must stay with his rival of Thebes, Creon, whose son is set to marry Antigone. However, in Creon's hubris for control and hatred towards the gods, he denies the mourning of Oedipus and his brothers Ateocles and Polynices after their deaths. By doing so, he condemns his own son, Haman, his wife Eurydice, and Antigone to take their own lives in defiance and desperation. For the Ungoi, the act itself is meant to be explosive and deadly, an act of martyrdom that uses unaliving oneself as a weapon of mass destruction. In today's world, we know this all too well, seeing attacks occur that take the lives of men, women, and children. As the world waged its second war in the 1940s, the Japanese military designated specific squads as kamikaze fighters to take out vessels and soldiers in acts of martyrdom. Meaning spirit or God's wind, the kamikaze fighter pilots carried explosives into battle and crashed into warships as an act of last resort. What's interesting is that the term kamikaze carries some folklore and history among the Japanese. Dating back to the 13th century, during the rule of the Mongols in East Asia, the Mongolian Empire wanted to expand further east. In their attempt to sail towards Japan, the Mongols faced a harrowing typhoon that devastated a third of their seafaring fleet, killing over 13,000 men. After some years had passed, the Mongols attempted another invasion of Japan but as they were unable to find suitable landings, another typhoon hit the fleet and decimated over half of the Mongols' forces. In response to this, the Japanese people named the typhoons Kamikaze in honor of the gods of wind, sea, lightning, and war, Fujin, Ryujin, Raijin, and Hashiman, as it was these four gods who had protected their land and their people from invading forces, showcasing their divine power. Though unassuming, the Ungoi are a deadly force when given proper provocation and weaponry, whether it's in their fanaticism for the great journey or their overwhelming numbers. The Ungoi attack an enemy harshly under their leaders. Tartarus, the prophets have betrayed us. <laughs> No, Arbiter! The great journey has begun, and the brutes, not the elite, shall be the prophet's escort. As a race of incredible strength and ferocity, the Jirohane, known to humans as brutes, have become one of the central antagonists within the Halo series. Described as a gorilla-like sapient species, they are extremely capable and were the last species to join the Covenant in 2492, just 33 years before the start of the Human Covenant War in 2525. First introduced in Halo 2, the Jirohane are direct rivals to the Sanghili, taking over their role within the Covenant as the protectors of the Shan Shayum and warriors of the Great Journey. It's with the Great Schism that we witness just how powerful, and even how faithful, the Jirohane are when driven by a divine purpose. However, their brutality and dominating nature stems from the fact that they are a predatory species, meaning that they are in a constant pursuit of control and of food sources. Which, speaking of food, the Jirohane are particularly fond of devouring their enemies no matter the size emphasizing their propensity for violence. Originating from the planet Doisak, the Jurohane have primarily existed as tribal societies 
where each tribe was led by a singular chieftain, a role which has daunted many players when playing on Legendary as these chieftains carry their signature gravity hammer, again demonstrating their strong desire for close quarters combat and violence. Thankfully, when looking at the tribal nature of the Jirohane, it can actually provide our first look into the relationship with mythology. For many tribes of the ancient world, like the Gauls, Thracians, and Iberians, they were considered barbarians by the great civilized nations, with nations like Rome and the Greeks before them taking up arms against these tribal and nomadic people because of their way of life and religious worship. For many, they followed a polytheistic belief just like their opposing factions. However, due to their less organized social and religious structure, these tribes would associate deities with an element, a specific tribe, or even a place. For instance, the Thracian goddess of the moon and hunting, Bendis, was fervently worshipped in groves and wooded areas during the Late Bronze Age. The worship of Bendis would actually find its way into the Greek pantheon with the goddess Artemis, the deity of the moon and hunting. For the worship of idols, also known as idolatry, it was a practice seen throughout the ancient world before and even during the rise of the Abrahamic religions. Societies like the tribes described as well as the Egyptians and the Vedic people were all practitioners of idol worship, as these idols were considered the conduits of cult worship, acting as a physical embodiment of a god, goddess, or even the divine powers for worshippers to provide offerings to and proclaim their devotion. These idols could take the form of statues in a god's likeness, slates of a god's representation, or even small icons meant for veneration while on the move. Concerning the Jirohane, prior to their conversion to the Covenant religion, their tribes or clans throughout their homeworld of Doisak practice primarily idol and totem worship, with each clan having their own totem of worship to their ancient pantheon, much like the ancient worship of the Thracian goddess Bendis where the Thracian people would provide offerings to their idol of the moon, so too did the Jirohane with their totems of worship. This is because their worship as well revolved quite literally around the lunar cycles of Doisak's three moons, Warriel, Soryapt, and Tish. Being much like Earth, Doisak's moons affected the tides and displayed cycles between new and full moons swaying the Jirohane's beliefs towards their gods and hunting rites, as the moon was capable of providing light in the night, but can provide some notion of omens with their disappearance and reappearance. As for totem worship, known as totemism, they function much like the idols expressed earlier. However, it's with totems that each clan or tribe of the Jirohane can dictate their heritage and lineage. Comparatively, the totem poles of the native people of North America used these poles to signify their connections to different elements, animals, spirits, and even timelines, with many relating to the classification of people or even the natural protector of their group. Of course, the indigenous people of North America were not the only ones to practice this, as in one study by Goldenweiser in 1910 they found that totems of varying sizes in Australia, of the Aranda people, were used in ceremonies consisting of stone rubbing, rock decoration, and even bloodletting, all made in efforts to strengthen not only their own bonds to their totem animal, but to strengthen the animal or representation of that said animal, thus strengthening their people in the coming seasons. Being given the designation Servus Ferox by the Forerunners, meaning wild slave in Latin, the brutes exemplify their wild nature throughout the series, noting that when they are at their most vulnerable, they become slaves to their brutal nature, acting as wild animals in an absolute fit of rage. 
much like the Mega Legolo, in their rage after losing their Bond brother, the Jirohane will go berserk in a gorilla-like fury, even becoming stronger in some cases. What's interesting to observe is that the brute's designs come from what we see with Earth's gorillas and their pack or family group behavior, with a single silverback taking a leadership role within the group, just like what is seen in Halo 2 with Tartarus, the only silver and white brute among the others, sharing with us, the player, that he is their leader, their chieftain. As for present-day gorillas, we acknowledge their existence within the jungles and forests of Africa. However, for a period of time, these great apes were considered a myth by much of the world until their discovery in 1847, written about and studied by Thomas Savage and Jeffries Wyman in their book The Proceedings of the Boston Society of Natural History. They describe what they called Troglodytes Gorilla, later named the Western Gorilla. Here, the naturalists categorize the apes into the orang grouping, pairing the gorillas to the orangutans seen in Central and Southern Asia. What ultimately makes this classification mythical, and even relating back to the Jirohane as ape-like, is the epithet wild men, a similar calling to the name wild slave for the Jirohane. For the Hubei province of central China, people for seemingly thousands of years have believed in creatures called Yeren. In the folklore of the region, the people believe that these Yeren are wild men and slaves to their violent instincts, desiring large quantities of food and women to have their way with above all else. One of the first instances of these wild men dates back to China's Warring States period in ancient poems written by Qu Yuan during the 3rd century BCE, describing these creatures as large and hairy humanoid spirits who act out their most basic and violent instincts. Out of these folktales of the Yeren, we can relate them to the violent and brutish nature of the Jirohane, as many of them display similar features with the descriptions of not only the Yeren, but of orangutans and gorillas. With somewhat elongated faces, broad and flattened nostrils, as well as ape-like fur covering much of their body. I should mention that along with their Latin name connecting with Chinese folklore, the title of brutes given to the Jirohane by humanity holds its fair share of links to myths and legends. See, the word itself, brute, derives from the Latin word brutus, meaning dull or stupid, a word that has had a lasting impression with the legendary assassination of Julius Caesar, as well as a subtle connection to the origin of Britain. In the first, a political and supposed friend to Julius Caesar, Marcus Junius Brutus, saw the tyrannical leadership of Caesar and had secretly joined with a group known as the Liberatores. Wanting to free Rome and her people from Caesar's regime, this group and the other senators gathered together to assassinate Julius Caesar on that faithful day of the Ides of March, now known as the 15th of March, Brutus was the first to strike Caesar in the back, stabbing him deep then letting each senator strike, leaving Caesar bloodied and dead on the Senate floor. It's worth mentioning that this story of the historic death has been mythicized over the last 2,000 years, sparking dozens if not hundreds of retellings, embellishments, and misconceptions, such as the final phrase uttered by Caesar, et tu brute, meaning, and you, Brutus. As for the second connection with the Latin word Brutus, we can look to the origin of Britain and its supposed founder and first king, Brutus of Troy. The story of Brutus is a little complicated as it takes notes from historical moments while adding in some biases and differing perspectives. The story goes that as the city of Troy fell after its decade-long war with the Mycenaean Greeks, a prince of Troy, Aeneas, 
sailed from the ruins being promised a land of salvation for his people. After founding Italy and ruling as king, Aeneas had his sons take up his rule after his time as king. One of his sons, Ascanius, was to have his own son brought into the world. However, a magician or soothsayer came to them, informing them of the child's incredible fate that would rival that of Aeneas. After the boy's birth, his mother soon after died from the pains of childbirth. Seeing how his wife died in such a brutish way, and angered towards the child, Ascanius would name his son Brutus. As the boy grew older, he became a fierce warrior for his country, but in an accident had mortally wounded his father with an arrow. Thus, he was banished from his homeland and set off to wander the world. After his travels, he came upon an island of green hills that he would claim in his own honor and name calling his new home Britain. Not a bad story at all. However, this has several different variations that confuse the entire narrative. For starters, in the Historia by Virgil and Titus Livius, they don't exactly clarify if Ascanius is really the father of Brutus or if it's Silvius, another of Aeneas' sons. As well, an account by the notable 7th century scholar Isidore of Seville claims in his encyclopedia titled Origines shares that the name of the country of Britain derives from the word bruti, meaning animalistic or savage, as Isidore was a Roman scholar who viewed the Britons as nothing more than savages and barbarians. Though the first time that the name Brutus is mentioned is in the 9th century account of the Historia. Britonium. Much like Herodotus and his written account, The Histories on Greek Society, the Histories Britonum dictates some historical events, but does also involve myths in the founding of the Britons. All in all, this tale of Brutus is more than likely a mythical creation story for the people of Britain and the land they now live on. With the view of the Brightons as savages by Roman scholars, the Jirohane of the Halo series are seen just as much by humanity, as well as with the Sanghili seeing the Brutes as nothing more than that. Brutes. Nevertheless, one Brute among the many, Tartarus, the chieftain of the Brutes, proves to not be like any normal Brute, both in his history and connections to mythology. To briefly explain, Tartarus began his career under the command of his uncle Maccabeus, the ruling chieftain at the start of the Jirohanes joining with the Covenant. Tartarus would prove himself to be a strong and capable fighter during the skirmishes on harvest in 2525, where he was able to claim his right as a commander among his squad. Soon after challenging his uncle for the title of chieftain, Tartarus brutally killed Maccabeus in ritualistic fighting, taking not only the title, but his uncle's weapon, the Fist of Rukt, leading to where we encounter the Chief of the Brutes in Halo 2, working as the second-in-command to the Prophet of Truth. For Tartarus, his name is befitting of his brutal characteristics, as being the name of the deepest part of the underworld in Greek mythology. Sitting below Hades, so far down that Hesiod mentions in his writings from Theogony that if an anvil fell from the earth, it would take nine whole days to reach the very top of Tartarus. Makes you wonder just how far down the Arbiter fell in that pit. But for the Greeks, Tartarus, it was believed to be the prison and punishment for the most wicked among the Greeks. Seeing figures such as the Cyclopes, Hecatonchores, Kronos, as well as some kings like Tantalus and Sisyphus, to name a few, being locked in eternal torment. For many of these prisoners, they had challenged the ruling power, such as Kronos in the Titanomachy, while others abused the gods' powers and wits, like the king Sisyphus. This prison and place of punishment 
is appropriate in linking the chieftain of the brutes, as he is the one enforcing the punishment against those deemed unworthy or unfit of the great journey, working hand in hand with the prophets to eliminate those deemed heretics in the eyes of the gods. However, being a prison is not the only view that the Greeks had for what Tartarus was, being described again in Theogony as the primordial being of the abyss within Greek cosmology. Being the third son of Chaos, he would bed his sister Gaia, the personification of the earth, and create the precursor to all monsters of Greek myth, Typhon. Sadly, the primordial Tartarus is not discussed in a lot of detail in Greek myth, but when comparing the two, we can find that each bears some resemblance, as both exist as chaotic and gruesome entities in their own universes, with Halo's Tartarus reveling in the erupting chaos within the Covenant, while the Greek Tartarus is believed to revel in the creation of a monster of malice and fire, with both leading to brutal destruction and death. Speaking of death and destruction, it's with Maccabeus, the uncle of Tartarus and former chieftain of the Brutes, who shares their own links to myths and legends. Just as Tartarus upheld his faith in the Forerunners and the Great Journey, as well as the service to the San Shayum, so too did Maccabeus. So much so, that many Jerohane respected his devotion and leadership. In battle, Maccabeus was a tough fighter, utilizing a potent energy shield that is described in the book Contact Harvest as capable of withstanding hundreds of rounds from assault and battle rifles. As well, Maccabeus was known for his signature weapon, the same weapon that would end up being his demise, the Fist of Rukt. It's with this weapon and Maccabeus' name that allow us to look back to the second century BCE to understand the significance of this chieftain. Between the years 168 and 141 BCE, the land of Judea saw consistent acts of rebellion against the Hellenistic Empire of the Seleucid. Ruling for almost 200 years, the Seleucid Empire was a Greek power that used its former Macedonian authority to influence the Asian and Middle Eastern world. However, as the Jewish religion grew in prominence in the land of Judea, the Jewish people revolted against the forced sway of the Greek gods in their everyday life. Leading the rebellion against the Seleucids was Judas Maccabeus, a religious warrior and priest among the Jewish who would see him claim his new name Judah Maccabee and begin the dedication ceremony known as Hanukkah that we see today. As the third son of the Jewish priest Matthias, Judas fought directly under his father and proved himself to be a strong leader and tactician in guerrilla warfare. Sadly, Matthias would be captured and crucified, ushering in Judas to lead in his stead. Under his command, Judas would fell the Seleucid forces in such abundance and with such ferocity that in the first year of his supremacy, Judas would claim the surname Maccabee. The reason being that, according to Jewish folklore, the name Maccabee was an acronym for the verse within the Torah, who is like you among the heavenly powers Lord, a surname that would continue on to represent the forces under Judah's rule during the revolt. In addition, Judah's forces and himself would remove the Greek idols from Judea, purifying the land for their own worship. This act would see the Temple of Jerusalem restored to its original purpose and begin the dedication and re-consecration of the temple, creating the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. This surname connects back to Halos Maccabeus, as he was one of the most devoted among the Jerohanim in their belief of the Forerunner gods. In the same way, the Maccabees and Maccabeus are some of the most devoted in their faith of their god, Yahweh. To the connection of the surname Maccabee to the Torah, the name does have an additional connection to its etymology, 
as the name Maccabee in Aramaic, Maccabah in modern day Hebrew, Maccathbet, are the potential origins of the name, with both meaning hammer. Using this moniker signifies just how powerful Judah Maccabee would come to be as both a priest and religious warrior. This again brings us back to Maccabeus of the Jerohane, who would use the ceremonial battle hammer, the Fist of Rukt, in his fights against the warring tribes of Jerohane before their joining of the Covenant, as well in their first bout against humanity. Though seen and respected as a fierce leader and warrior, it would be his nephew, Tartarus, who would challenge his leadership, leading to Maccabeus' death in ritualistic fighting and loss of his weapon, passing down the role of chieftain and paving the way for the Tartarus that we would come to see in Halo 2, the brutal Hammer of the Covenant, the Makaba of the Prophet of Truth, the Chieftain, the Brutes. If you enjoyed this breakdown and want to show your support for the channel, then check out my Patreon. I just started it, and your direct support makes this channel run smoother and produce higher quality videos. As well, don't forget to subscribe and like the video to help make this video spread. If you want more breakdowns and connections, you can click right here for more Halo. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all. Silence fills the empty grave now that I am gone. But my mind is not at rest, for questions linger on.